Okay, everyone, we're going to talk about composition. We've already talked about that a little bit in our coursework we've done so far, but we're really going to dive into it today, and I'm going to kind of narrate this PowerPoint presentation for you all. It shouldn't take more than like 15-20 minutes. Let's just take a quick look at this initial image right here and look at some of the things we're seeing. Right now what we can see is that the main figure is adjusted to the left hand side of the composition. They are not positioned right dead center. And, and I would say that there's maybe two main focal points, maybe three main focal points. One being the little cute dog's face, the other being the subject, the figure's face as well, and then the other being that red kind of sun up in the right hand corner. What we can see is that both of, or all three of those focal points kind of lead our eye all around the composition. And I think that this composition really would feel quite heavy on the left hand side with both of those, um, with the dog and the man, if that red sun wasn't up in the right hand corner kind of balancing it out. So I think this composition really achieves some great balance as well. So this, uh, just kind of some context, this is an artist named Devin Shimiyoma. I believe that's how you pronounce his last name. He is a Pittsburgh local, and he teaches at CMU. His work is wonderful. Uh, if you want to check out more of his work, you should. He recently had a big show at the Andy Warhol Museum. All right. So composition in general refers to the organization, arrangement, and combination of elements within the borders of a drawing space. The main goal is to pull the eye of the viewer across the artwork, taking in individual elements and focal points to finally rest on the main feature. And this could be anything from subject matter to emotional effects. The compositions are created by us, the artists, and more often than not, the artist will try out several versions of the final artwork in sketch, in sketch form, like with our thumbnail sketches and our gesture drawings, before settling on the thing the, the most visually pleasing um, composition. So a strong composition can intuitively engage your viewers. They may look at it and not even realize why it's so pleasing to them. Uh, but we as the artists have kind of crafted that experience behind the scenes because we know uh, how to use different strategies to do that. Your personal preferences and natural instincts are also important, and I could say that just seeing all of you draw right now, all of you do have a pretty good intuition when it comes to composition already. So some of these things I'm going to show you, now maybe you could be more cognizant of what you're intuiting and use those things more intentionally and more deliberately. All right, so let's talk about the elements of composition. So we are, I already kind of mentioned focal point, it's kind of obvious, but that is a primary center of interest or focus in the drawing or painting. Usually an artwork only has one or two focal points. If you include three, that's typically very, very hard. We're gonna see an example of an artist that used more than three focal points, uh, but it, it can be very tricky. Um, another thing that makes for a really great composition is overlapping. So when you overlap objects, in space, it'll create a sense of depth and balance. But you can also think about a foreground, middle ground, and background, or distant space. And you do so by letting those grounds overlap with one another. We'll find some more examples of that later on. You can also think about negative space. So that is the space that is uh, surrounding your major subject matter. Uh, the space within your drawing that's not occupied by a focal point or an important subject. Oftentimes you can uh, balance out a lot of heavy elements that are your focal point with negative space, which we saw with that very first example. And then you can also use lines as a navigation tool to guide the viewer through different elements of the drawing. This can happen just with your line work. Maybe you're working with directional lines that really give a sense of movement or repetition. Perhaps you're also even utilizing implied lines, so that's where you've kind of suggested that the line uh, draws your, your eye to a focal point and it can lead you around the picture plane. We'll get more into that in a moment. 
Another element of composition is balance, so a stable arrangement of subjects within a composition. Sometimes you'll see artists break this rule because they want that sense of uneasiness. Sometimes you'll look at uh, artwork and it may feel awkward or uneasy, uh, and maybe the artist has done that deliberately, and it may be because there's kind of an off-balance thing happening within the picture plane. Uh, contrast. So usually when we talk about contrast, it's w in regard to value, but really you can talk about contrast with, with uh, any element in your picture plane having some kind of difference. So that could even be with texture, even scale. You have a lot of small things and then one really big thing. Uh, it can be through value, so you have a high contrast of lights, highlights, and darks. Uh, that really help create your shapes and patterns in your composition. Uh, the other thing, another key thing of composition, which we dived into uh, this last week, was proportion. So that's also, you know, talking about our objects in proportion to how they look in real life from observation. But also, are you thinking about the amount of space that you've allocated to those various components in your drawing? So. Thinking about the negative space, have you positioned an element too close to an edge? Uh, does it feel a little precarious? And then isolation is another strategy you can use. So we naturally are drawn to the thing that stands out. So let's just say you have an image and you have all red apples and then on the right hand side there's one green apple. Well, we, we immediately uh, will be drawn to that and that kind of uses several components that uses contrast and color But it also uses isolation you're isolating this one element to stand out and kind of be a focal point in your composition All right, so we're gonna look at some examples. I just thought this was a cool example to show you all right now This painting just debuted. This is a painting by Amy Sherald of Brianna Taylor. She painted this uh, for Vanity Fair Amy Sherald was also commissioned to do a portrait of the First Lady, Michelle Obama, and we'll look at that in a moment. It's a really gorgeous painting. Her compositions are very interesting to look at because they kind of break that rule of positioning your subject matter right dead center in the composition. But what you can see here is that she kind of uh, negotiates that through the stance of this figure, that this figure isn't just sitting with or standing with both arms down by their by her side but the arm is kind of raised up and it the the kind of diagonal that's created by Brianna's arm on the right hand side leads our eye down towards the composition to her other hand which then kind of leads us back up with that gold ring leads us to the gold necklace it's kind of like this even though it's a very subtle and subdued painting there's actually a lot of complexity happening within the composition even though it's a central one and, and with all that to be said, it's also just such a beautiful and striking painting to have been done right now. Uh, okay, talking about focal points. That's a huge thing with composition. It's a specific area where you want your viewer to focus, their majority of their attention. So typically you would always place your focal point off-center in your composition. Sometimes you break this rule, as we've just seen. And then you can also make good use of secondary focal points to frame the main one. We'll look at some examples in a minute. Um, let's see. You can define your focal point with more detail and a stronger contrast and texture scale values than other aspects of your drawing. So you can kind of use all those strategies to really bring out that focal point. Okay, this is an interesting painting. This is also another local Pittsburgh artist named Susu. She's gaining a lot of kind of traction right now in the Pittsburgh art scene. I thought that this was a very interesting painting to show you because this one really has so many points of view and focal points. Uh, I think that it's typically very hard to achieve something as cool as this painting, but you can see we have a focal point here where these monkeys seem to be receding and warping into this weird black hole in the background. And then we have another focal point that kind of goes down here where these monkeys are now in cartoon shape uh, and, and coming back into this space. And then clearly we have this monkey as the main focal point. This is the monkey that seems to be the most well rendered and the, clear, the clearest. 
And then over here on this left hand side, then we have this like crazy swiggle wiggle of like warping monkeys melting. And it really kind of leads our eye. And it, it also kind of repeats some of the warping that's happening here on the right hand side. So I'd say, although there's so much chaos, and absurdity happening in this composition, it really overall looks great because it's balanced, right? Um, and we kind of like our eyes led all around. But then there's lots of cool moments to rest and let our eye kind of linger and really observe and see like what the hell is going on in this painting. Um, lots of interesting things. Okay. All right, another strategy we talked about a little bit last week was overlapping for unity and depth. You all aren't really thinking about this quite yet, but whenever I set up your still lives, I'm thinking about this quite a bit. Uh, it can be kind of, you know, a craft to set up a really good still life, one that will yield good compositions. So I want you to, you to all think about that when you're drawing from home. You all will be creating your own compositions and your own still lives, and that will have a lot to do with how how successful your drawings are. So overlapping objects, you can place objects in front of one another and have them kind of overlap in the distance. Uh, that creates a depth of field and it's just visually pleasing. Uh, observe your subject carefully before you begin drawing and plan for places where you can utilize overlapping. All right, using lines to your advantage. Leading lines, you'll hear me talk about that a lot. Leading lines can invite and encourage the viewer to enter the drawing space, explore the focal point, and linger to investigate the many facets of the composition. You can use actual lines, or you can use implied lines. We'll see an example of that in a moment. Uh, you can use various types of line to put different kinds of emotions and moods into your compositions. Uh, remain conscious of what effect lines can have in your drawings. So if you kind of render something with very scratchy, scribbly lines, it may lend itself to a more chaotic, kind of energized feel. If you render something with very small, delicate, precise lines, that may yield a, a kind of seren serene, uh, more calm, peaceful mood. All right, here are two different examples of leading lines. This is Ginny Seville. She's a wonderful figurative painter, very well known. And what I love about the image on the left hand side is through these leading lines, these kind of swooping lines that move around her body and in front of her baby. And this is like one baby that's moving at once. I think this is such an amazing portrayal of what motherhood must feel like. I'm not a mother, but it must be close. This wiggly baby moving in her arms constantly. We get that sense not only through her rendering of that figure over and over, but because of these leading lines that kind of swoop in and out and kind of create this radial kind of feel, and we get that sense of movement. There's also all of these kind of gestural lines. It feels like these figures are truly moving in real time, even though we know this is a static image. All right, this one on the right, this is actually a friend of mine, Carrie Lingscheit. She's got a lot of gorgeous work. She uses these kind of leading lines, and I would even say these implied lines. So implied lines are where maybe it's not one continuous line, it's a suggestion of a line, and maybe it breaks off at some point, and it's quite subtle. So all of these really kind of help us get a sense of the space. It feels a little ghostly. This figure is, is also isolated. This artist is also using contrast in value, but also in texture. We've got a lot of these kind of like scratchy lines over here that does give a sense of kind of feels a little ominous to me, I suppose. This is a great example of uh, figure drawing with movement and leading lines. There's this kind of kinetic energy that's happening around this figure. All of these lines moving in a very dynamic, uh, crazy way. Uh, that really, and then this this figure is rendered with a little bit more softness and delicateness, and that, in contrast to this crazy line work behind, really, really is effective, I think. But these could also be regarded as leading lines. They lead our eye back to the figure. Got some Giacometti. He is all about line work. He also does, he did sculptures. He's a famous was a famous artist. Um, 
but you can see that all of these are kind of like one continuous contour drawing, but the lines kind of lead us in and out of the focal points, which are, I would say, the eyes and some of the, the features on the face. And then we got some Van Gogh. So many directional lines happening here. So many leading lines. These lines lead us to this space, which lead us over here, and then up through the tree, and then throughout the sky, and then back down. Just so much joy in this piece. I, I love it so much. Okay, another strategy is you can use rhythm and repetition in a predictable way to unify your composition. You th can think about it like music. When you have a beat repeated throughout a song, it creates a kind of unification and balance. So this is a Van Gogh uh, where using the multiple and repetition of these flower forms, uh, and they recede in the background. It's not all the way throughout. It's not completely full of flowers. There's this kind of negative space on the left-hand side here that balances out the flowers. So talking about balancing, uh, most good drawings result from carefully planning the balance of various subjects. A balanced drawing is more aesthetically pleasing and harmonious. Uh, you must take into consideration sizes and placements and values of the subjects. So you do that a lot, of course, through planning, through thumbnail sketches and gesture drawings. We already talked about this, but it is a big one. Placing an odd number of objects into a grouping, rather than an even number, makes the composition more pleasing. Balancing three objects on one side um, is more interesting than four. Um, you can also consider, and this is in regards to balance, consider the negative and positive space and how objects are cropped by the picture plane. If you have a lot of, a lot of visual weight with your focal points and your subject matter, maybe the way to balance that out is by incorporating more negative space. We'll see different examples of that in a moment. Okay, so thinking about balance, there's so many great things happening in this. This is one of the other faculty, David Stanger. He's another professor in the art department, and his work is just just beautiful. But you can see that really there's three main focal points, I would argue, and, and then there's kind of a hidden one that I wonder if any of you are seeing right now as you're taking a look at this. But you can see there's an arrangement of three main focal points, the pitcher, the chair, and this plant. And it allows our eye to kind of bounce around this composition. But if we linger a little bit over here, we'll see that there's per perhaps another more subtle focal point, which is the reflection of this figure in the window, uh, which feels kind of ethereal and spiritual in some way. Um, but you can also see like just even the direction of the floorboards are kind of like leading lines into the room. Uh, there's a lot of balance. There's a lot of weight here, which is kind of balanced out by this chair. Um, so, so there's some interesting structures happening in this example. All right, delegating proportions to your subjects. We've learned this a little bit last week as well. So we were talking about drawing the objects you're looking at in proportion to one another, but you also have to think about drawing them in proportion uh, to your composition, to the size that you want to emphasize. You know, do you want everything, do you want some things kind of large and big and in proportion? They recede in the background and there, there's some distance and they become a little bit smaller. Thinking through that through sketching will help. All right, so now we're actually going to talk about some official kind of composition structures that are kind of tried and true. There's always ways of um, breaking the rules a little bit, but these, these structures may help you when you think about composition intentionally. So the first is I had been listed O-shaped. So this is Kahindi Wiley. He was the artist commissioned to do the presidential portrait for Obama. Gorgeous painter. He does a lot of figurative portraiture. I would say this is technically kind of like an O composition because the main subject is presented in the middle of the picture plane in kind of like an oval uh, manner. And then we have all of these like gorgeous florals are behind him. But you'll notice that there are a few that kind of pop out. So like this bright one here, 
brings us to this purple one, to this one, to his face. So there's kind of these like focal points here that bounce us around and then bring us back to his portrait. I would say it's similar for Amy Sherald's uh, portrait of Michelle Obama. Although there's something else kind of happening here. There's almost like we have these leading lines from the dress uh, coming up this way and this way, bringing us to Michelle's figure up here. There's also kind of this triangular uh, compositional strategy happening in this in this uh, painting. So although the figures are in the center of the composition, they're still kind of balanced because of these other considerations the artists are making. This, this is a good example of an O-shaped composition. It's not a perfect O, but it, it's kind of more organic. This is a friend of mine who's a painter, representational painter. Um, he lives in Cleveland, and he, he has balanced the weight of all of this, of these clothes in the middle here, by the negative space. So you'll notice that he simplified this background, and he deliberately chose to kind of white it out, make it feel blank and empty, which then emphasizes this more and makes it, it isolates it and emphasizes the focal point a little bit more. All right, Frank Stella, this is an example of a uh, of use of diagonals and also leading lines. Notice that this looks as if it's receding back into space, like, as if it's some kind of hallway you could walk down. Uh, but notice that the, the center point, there is, these lines do not recede into a main central point right in the middle of the composition. They are offset just a bit. And I think that's something that adds just more visual interest, and it also makes us think a little bit more. It makes us question what's actually happening here. You can also see there's like some triangular compositional strategies happening in quadrants. It's geometric, it kind of fits together. Um, there's repetition. I'm sure there's more you could think of. All right, this is a great, uh, this is a great example of an L-shaped composition. So oftentimes an L-shaped composition is in the shape of an L, and then there's something else balancing it that is in contrast to the L shape. So in this instance, we have the L shape being formed out of the trees and the horses, and then the negative space of the sky kind of balances that out. Another strategy that is happening, you'll notice that there are an odd number of horses. There are five horses, not four. And you'll notice that there's some contrast happening in color. One white horse that stands out and is a little bit isolated that horse is not presented right dead center. Imagine if it was right here, this horse right here, if that was the horse in white and this was in brown. How our eye would just want to sit and rest here. We, it would be hard for us to kind of be interested in looking all around the composition. All right, this is another one of Carrie's, uh, this is actually a print. And this is a great example of like an S-shaped composition. Uh, S-shaped compositions are typically used in landscape, I would say. Think about a road receding into the background or a river receding. Uh, but this is such a great one. And it's also like, her work is typically very emotional and psychological. But this also is a great example of leading lines. So these leading lines that kind of bring us back into the foreground. And then I would say this is a focal point. And this is a focal point, and the hair and the S-shape really connects both of those together. Another thing that's interesting is we have these kind of leading lines of these drips, and they're upside down, and it just creates an interesting contrast, the drippy, watery nature of those marks in the background. It's an interesting contrast to the kind of consistent um, line work of the hair. So you can also think about line work. What is the best quality of line that will convey your mood? And Carrie really considered, okay, this washy, kind of drippy mark will really help me convey the fact that this is supposed to feel like there's water and there's hair being drugged down the drain. Um, you know, so that, that I think that was a smart decision on her part. Okay, another example of an L-shaped composition. L being created here by the gas um, 
thingy. <laughs> and then the negative space being ba balanced over here with the kind of like drive through area. Lots of great contrast happening. Uh, this was achieved through charcoal. So you can look forward to getting to into utilizing charcoal like this soon. This will be really fun for us. All right, last structure, we're almost done. We need to talk about the rule of thirds. This, uh, the rule of thirds is actually a mathematical concept that can be pretty com like complex and it's based on the golden mean. Um, we're not gonna go into that right now, but if you're interested, you can look into it. Um, basically what the rule of thirds is, is that you, this applies to design, it applies to photography, it applies to drawing, it, it applies to painting, and artists have been utilizing it forever, the early 1800s until now. And what, what we talk about with rule of thirds is you can, you divide your picture plane, that's a rectangle, into thirds. So you have, you cut it into three quadrants, vertically and horizontally, and where those lines intersect here, here, and here, and here. For whatever reason, it just turns out that humans are very, very much attracted to these focal points. So the kind of rule of thumb is if you position any area of interest in your composition along one of these points, it doesn't have to be all of them, but along one of those points, it will just automatically look interesting. Another kind of trick is if you place any kind of, like let's just say you want to take a picture of a landscape or paint a landscape, if you position the horizon line along one of these lines, the rule of thirds lines, it just automatically makes for an interesting image instead of like placing the horizon line right in the middle here. And then we can talk about the kind of diagonal lines that are created through these focal points, I guess people call them power points. Uh, if you align anything along these diagonals, that can also help uh, your composition because it's leading our eye to the main focal points um, and kind of taking us all around. So here are some examples. All right, so instead of having this figure placed right dead center in the middle of the composition, this person has aligned the figure along the left-hand side the focal points, you know, the figure is like along the focal points. The other thing we can think about is this is kind of an L-shaped uh, composition, an L-shape being like the figure and then the horizon line kind of creates this L-shape and it's balanced by the sky and the water. So anytime you decide to place uh, a compositional element along one of these power points or along one of these lines, it just makes for a more interesting composition. You can utilize all of them at once. You can see that um, this kind of like table is has been aligned along this um, line here. And then the focal point is being activated by this picture. And it allows our eye to kind of move around the whole composition. Oh, that text got upside down. I'll have to change that. Anyway, those of you that are good at reading upside down, you can take a look and know that this is, was painted by Renoir and it's of Monet painting. And you can see that this, the artist has deliberately aligned the fence along this rule of thirds line here. And that Van Gogh is positioned towards the right hand side of the composition. Again, not right dead center. And hit the weight of the figure in the paint the painting and the easel and the houses is balanced by all of the the kind of movement and rhythm happening with the flowers over here. All right, another one you'll probably learn in art history by Rembrandt, the anatomy lesson of um, Dr. Nicholas Pulp. They used to like take apart dead bodies so that they could learn science and anatomy. So that's what's happening in here. But you'll notice that all four focal points PowerPoints, the areas where the rule of thirds are intersecting, are all activated in this painting. So we've got his face, his face, dead guy's face, 
and then this hand, it's not directly on the focal point, but it's leading us to it. And what that allows us to do is really kind of like bounce our eyes all over. All right, so I'm gonna wrap up now. Let's go over how you can make good dynamic compositions. Pick a great subject, choose the size, think about that in advance, what scale. Think about cropping. Lots of times in beginning drawing, I have students that have a really hard time allowing any of the elements to kind of fall off the edge of your picture plane. And they wanna isolate all of the elements in the middle of their composition and they wanna have a lot of negative space around it. We don't wanna do that necessarily, although we did look at the O-shaped compositions. But really try to like think about zooming in, cropping in interesting ways, uh, letting those things fall off the edge of your paper. Think about placement. Another thing that can be tricky for people is when they, you can tell when people didn't, they weren't quite expecting the proportion of objects and they put something down and then all of a sudden you see like the tiny little, let's just say the candlestick from last week, uh, is situated towards the left hand side of your paper and it's about to fall off the edge but not quite. And that just ends up feeling awkward and precarious. So you wanna make it look intentional. Either you leave a good margin or you let it fall right off the edge of the paper. Think about controlling your lines. I mean, we could push against that a little bit. Maybe you want crazy chaotic lines and you're letting your, yourself kind of explore that. But think about what kind of line you want. What kind of line can achieve a mood or feel that you want? Think about balancing positive and negative space. So positive space refers to the area that your subject matter takes up. So the figure, the apple, the candlestick. The negative space refers to the space around your subject matter. So the table, the sky, the water, the blank space, the white space. You can use both of those in good combinations to balance one another. Add contrast, contrast and texture. Like for instance, um, uh, apple next to a cube. We have a geometric uh, form next to a really more organic form. You can also think about contrast in value, in scale, in color. We haven't gotten to color yet, but we will at some point. And then the other thing is simplify distracting elements. So when you're creating your own still lives, think about are there things that are maybe more distracting than they are helpful in your still life? All right, so that was a brief introduction to compositions, a lot of information. Uh, I'm going to post this so you can feel free to go back through it and review that on your own time. All right.